are beautiful. And God's unfailing love has brought us close to him. What a moment. Wow. My assignment is to speak to us about family. So I'd like to begin with a few of my own family pictures. My wife, Marianne, is here, and together we appear with all of our children in this photo, uh, along with our granddaughter, uh, who's in the center back. We have five adult children. That's the next one. Uh, one son and four daughters. Our son was the very first to move out of the house on his own. And at that moment, our home uh, was renamed affectionately the girls' dorm, the Sea of Estrogen. Uh, yes, I love it. And our son is also married to our lovely daughter-in-law. And uh, they are the parents of our two grandchildren. The first one you saw. Yeah. That's Autumn Noel. She's the youngest of the two. And uh, she's actually 14 now, but that's my favorite picture of her. She's 14 months, 14 months, 14 months, not 14, 14 months. That's 14 months. I'll probably still show that when she's 14 too, right? That's my favorite. So please stand. Let's honor God, honor his word. As I read from Genesis chapter 45, verses 1 through 8. And Genesis 50, verses 18 through 21. Then Joseph could no longer control himself before all his attendants. And he cried out, have everyone leave my presence. So there was no one with Joseph when he made himself known to his brothers. And he wept so loudly that the Egyptians heard him and Pharaoh's household heard about it. Joseph said to his brothers, I am Joseph. Is my father still living? But his brothers were not able to answer him because they were terrified at his presence. Then Joseph said to his brothers, come close to me. When they had done so, he said, I am your brother, Joseph, the one you sold into Egypt. And now do not be distressed and do not be angry with yourselves for selling me here because it was to save lives that God sent me ahead of you. For two years now, there has been famine in the land. And for the next five years, there will be no plowing and reaping. But God sent me ahead of you to preserve for you a remnant on earth and to save your lives by great deliverance. So then it was not you who sent me here, but God who made me father to Pharaoh, Lord of his entire household and ruler of all Egypt. His brothers then came and threw themselves down before him. We are your slaves, they said. But Joseph said to them, don't be afraid. Am I in the place of God? You intended to harm me, but God intended it for good, to accomplish what is now being done, the saving of many lives. So then don't be afraid. I will provide for you and your children. And he reassured them and spoke kindly to them. Let's pray. Holy Spirit, you are our helper. Help us recognize the truth. Thank you for helping us now. Amen. Please be seated. <clears throat> Family matters. Family matters. <clears throat> Relationships are the most important thing in the world. And if you're already asking, does the use of the word matters in family matters appear as a noun or verb? If that matters to you, let me state it, the matter plainly. Yes, family matters. Relationships are the most rewarding thing in life, and they're the most challenging thing in life. And if you've only had more of one and not the other, hold on, because there's so much more to come. All of us have experienced family in such a way where it's both rewarding and also challenging. When family is rewarding, we go, this is blessing me. When family is challenging, we go, this is hurting me. And there are moments where we find ourselves going, this is blessing me. Other times, this is hurting me. This is blessing me. This is hurting me. 
and there's a tension. It's a struggle. The struggle is real, but it's all good. The struggle is real, but it's all good. In Romans chapter 8, verse 28, Paul says these words. And we know in all things, God works for the good of those who love him, who are called according to his purpose. And we know that God works in all things. Say all things. Now, I find tension there because I would have been happy if Paul had said, well, in one thing or a couple of things or a few things or even many things, but all things? How can you say something good about all things when some things are actually not good? How can you say something good about all things when some things are actually bad? The struggle is real, but it's all good. A.W. Tozer said this, It is doubtful whether God can bless a man greatly unless he hurts him deeply. It is doubtful whether God can bless a woman greatly unless he hurts her deeply. I don't like that quote any more than you. I say it this way. Everything hurtful, even if harmful, will eventually prove to be helpful. Everything hurtful in your life, everything hurtful in your family, everything hurtful in the relationships, your mom, your dad, your brother, your sister, everything hurtful, even if harmful, whether potentially or intentionally, everything harmful will eventually prove to be helpful. Why? Because we know that God, in all things, God is working for the good of those who love him, who are called according to his purpose. You've seen some of my family pictures. Joseph has a few of his own. We just read a couple of pictures. Now, that was around 1800 BC, so there was no iPhone. But if you read the text closely, everything on your iPhone is in there. There's brightness, there's color, there's saturation. There's there's all this stuff, it's beauty. But this first picture in Genesis 45, two things are happening in the same time. Joseph cries weeps so loudly, and at the same time, he calls his brothers close to him. He cries because of family matters, but he calls them close because family matters. And this picture, you need to understand, Joseph is about 40 years of age. He has not seen his brother since he was 17 years old. The last time he saw them, it was not good. They had sold him into slavery. He ended up in Egypt. And now, for the first time, he'd been interacting with them. They didn't recognize him because you don't look the same at 40 as you do at 17. He's got facial hair. His face has changed. Plus, he's speaking to them through an interpreter. But in this moment, he cries and says, everybody get out. And he reveals himself to his brother. I want to go back and juxtapose that moment with when he was 17. Can we go back and look at another family picture? Joseph, beautiful family picture. He is one of 13 siblings. Uh, One dad, Jacob, multiple mamas, which makes for a lot of drama. It is 12 boys, one girl. The one girl is Dinah. It is not the Sea of Estrogen. It is not the girl's dorm. In fact, it is actually the opposite. It is the, the, the boy's dorm. It is testosterone laden. And he is not the oldest. He is next to the youngest. Only one brother younger, Benjamin. And so in that culture, the firstborn, Reuben, would have the place of honor. But because he was born to Jacob in his old age, and he's also the son of the favorite wife. He was the favorite son. So immediately he's thrown into this emotional triangle between his parents, him and all his brothers. Him against any brother, him against Simeon, him against Levi, him against Judah. He's the favorite. So they didn't like him. Anybody got any siblings they don't get along with? Why'd your hands go up that fast? I mean, it was like. (laughs) Yeah, it's the problem. If you look at the family picture, the whole family's dressed nice. All the brothers are wearing Target, 
Uh, they're wearing, you know, Ross dress for less. They got on Payless shoes. They're looking really sporty. They're clean. They're looking good. Joseph, however, is wearing custom clothing. Lululemon. Ray-Ban glasses. Saks Fifth. Neiman Marcus. They can't stand the brother. They have Joseph rules. Whenever they speak to him, it is never kindly. Never. Hate him. Fact, one day, Joseph called the whole family together. He's like, Mom, Dad, I told you about my first dream. I had another dream. Everybody, Reuben, Simeon, live out, get around me. No, I, I, in the dream, Simeon, you were here. Benjamin, you were here. You were all in a circle, and, and I was in the middle, and I want to take a selfie, too, because you all were around me, and Mom and Dad, you were the sun and moons, and you guys were all the stars, and I just, this is just a great time to take a selfie. Can I take a selfie? Hold still, guys. Wait, I'm going to do this picture for you. Just smile. Okay. Yeah, yeah, and you were doing this in the dream, and you were doing that in the dream, and it was so beautiful, and it was so great to see you. I just, I just, it was such a great moment, and you were doing this in the dream, and I was like, oh my goodness, it was so great. I just throw back. Throw back. Don't even think about it. Don't even think about it. My wife did not give me permission to do that. They couldn't stand him. Couldn't stand him. One day he's going to check on his brothers because he didn't have to do the work. He just gave reports on his way. They said, here comes that dreamer. Let's kill him and see what happens to his dreams. Reuben's like, don't kill him. Come on, man. He's our brother. He gets close. They rip his robe, tear it off, push him in a pit. As he's being sold into slavery, the juxtaposition of the picture when he's 40 and when he's 17, even though it's more than 20 years, guys, this moment, they heard something that they heard when he was 17. When he was being sold, I imagine like, I'm your brother. Reuben, Simeon, Levi, I'm your brother. I'm Joseph. And here he is at 40, revealing himself. I'm Joseph, your brother. It is an emotionally overwhelming family charged moment as he's 40 years old standing with his brothers and now when they realize who he is and that he's not only a, no longer a slave but he's ruling in Egypt ah, oh, they're going like oh my bad bro I told you I told you not to do it but then what happens Joseph is no longer in the center He's no longer in the center with them because when their daddy died, they came and sent a letter saying, please forgive us, don't avenge yourself. He wept when he read the letter. He's been so transformed by God. And what happens when they come and surround him? He says, no, 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 no. Am I in the place of God? When I was 17, I was in the center. But I was so, so, when you're 17 years old, 17 and immaturity, they're not always synonymous, but often they are. But when he's over here, he's 40, and he won't be in the center anymore. He's like, no, we're brothers. Only God. Am I in the place of God? God alone is in the center. So he's locking arms with his brothers as they worship God together. He says, God sent me ahead of you, not instead of you. I want you to know something. Some of you think you've been instead of your brother, instead of your mama. You've been sent ahead, not instead. You might be the first, but you're not the only, and you're definitely not the last. You might be the first in your family to give your life to God, but he's intending to reach you, and through you, reach your family. Sent ahead, not instead. He made that so clear to them. He told him, he's like, you intended it for harm, but God intended it for good. You intended to harm me, but God intended it for good, to bring about this present reality, the purpose of God. And we know in all things, God works for the good of those who love him, who are called according to his purpose. Joseph realized I was never in the center. It was never about me. It was never my dream. It was all God's dream. I was just an instrument he wanted to work through to serve his purpose, the saving of many lives. 
You intended it for harm, but God intended it for good. This is what we have to get in our hearts. I'm learning this with you. Everything hurtful, even if it's harmful, will eventually prove to be helpful. Ah, oh, you don't get it. You don't get it. You don't get it. I want to tell you about some other bad boys from Detroit. Throwback, 1989. The Detroit Pistons, NBA basketball team. They're not who they are today. Today in basketball, what is called a flagrant one or a flagrant two foul, nobody would even blow a whistle. What was a foul then? Today it's called assault and battery. <laughs> They're called the bad boys because they were going to inflict pain on you, win or lose. Rick Mahorn, uh, Isaiah Thomas, Joe Dumars, all these other players are in there. And literally, yell out the players, the old heads, you know. Bill Lambeer, who else? Dennis Rodman, before he was Chicago Bulls, he was with them. Literally, if you got inside, they had Michael Jordan rules. When the Bulls played against them in 1989, they crushed them. Literally, they would grab you by your throat, body slam you, step on you. And the ref would say, get up, get up, next play. That's how it went down. It was such a beat down on the Chicago Bulls. They sat in their locker room at the end, deflated, discouraged, worst beat down ever. End of the playoff, you just, season's over, you're going on vacation. The whole Chicago Bulls team went back to their facility and started working out the very next day. Michael Jordan put on 15 pounds. Now, let me help you. Elite athletes, it is very hard for them to put on muscle. Something called EPOC, excess post-oxygen consumption. It means after your workout, you're still burning calories up to 24 hours. They're burning calories when they're sleeping. They're burning calories when they're eating. Some of us actually put on calories just looking at food. It is hard for them to put on weight. He had to put on muscle so he couldn't get thrown away and get built up. 1991, they play again. Me and Marianne got married that year. The Chicago Bulls beat the Pistons so badly, they swept them. It was incredible. Jordan said this, it is not in spite of the Pistons that we won the championship. It is all the more because of them that we won. I don't know if you hear what I'm saying. I'm going to make it plain. Jesus conquered death. He got up, but he didn't conquer in spite of death. He conquered all the more because of death. You and I don't conquer in spite of pain. We conquer all the more because of pain. We don't conquer in spite of shame. We conquer all the more because of shame. We don't conquer in spite of hurting. We conquer all the more because we're hurting. Welcome your pain. That's how you grow. That's how you grow. Your generation has to learn that you can lower and increase your pain of threshold. When you're whining, you're not winning. When you're blaming, you're not building. When you're grumbling, you're not growing. God wants you winning. God wants you building. God wants you growing. You can't whine and win at the same time. You cannot. You cannot. Jesus is the, I'm not even talking about basketball. Jesus is the greatest baller of all time. All eternity, God the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit put together a game plan and executed it flawlessly. God the Father said, I'll do this. Holy Spirit said, I'll do this. Jesus came on the court. He took the X's and the O's. He took the X and stood it up and made it a cross. He took the O and it was a tomb. And he got up three days later. But in between, he took the charge. He took the charge. He beat the devil by taking a charge and not won the game. Didn't need the score. I'm going to take the charge. Boom. Day one, day two, day three. Game over. Game over. Game over. Game over. Game over. What else you got? Bring it. Oh, death, that was your best shot? That's all you had was death? 
You ain't got nothing better than death. Punk. Pain is your friend. You are not winning when you're whining. Not growing when you're grumbling. Yeah, but you don't know my, you don't know my family of origin. Yeah, but I know about the origin of family. Family is not a bad idea. Family is not just a good idea. Family is God's idea. Before any of us existed, it was God the Father, Son, Holy Spirit. Family been around a long time, guys. And if you want to blame your parents, look at Joseph. With, <laughs> Joseph and his brothers had issues, but his daddy was Jacob. Jacob had issues with his brother Esau, so you got to go back before then. Then you go to uh, Jacob's, help me, Isaac. Isaac and Israel, then they got one. You have to go all the way back to the beginning, to the very first family, the very first man, and the very first woman. That's Married at First Sight, the original episode. They have two boys, and they have problems, Cain and Abel. And Cain was not able to regulate his emotions. God wants to teach you how to regulate your emotions, not be controlled by them. And if you think you're able, you're probably not. You're probably Cain. Catch your breath. When Marianne and I were married about six months, we were invited to a meeting and it was prophetic ministry. <laughs> so now you know how I changed. She looks the same. It's that black girl magic. Did you bring your extra toothbrush? Keep those edges straight. I did have a girl's dorm, so I know. No more than I should. But in this moment, we were asked to stand. And as we were standing, there were two people who were praying, a prophetic presbytery. We didn't know them. They didn't know us. The first man looked at me, and I'm 26 years old, and he says, all things, all things, all things work together for good to those who love God who call it according to his verse. Say it with me. All, all, spell it, A-L-L. -L. No, that's what he told me to do. He had me repeat him. I have no idea why. Until the second guy came up and said, I need to ask you a question. I said, sure. Yes, sir. He said, do you have a son? I was speechless. We got to go back to another picture of my life. Rewind from 26 to 17. When I graduated from high school, I was 17 years old and not much else. 17 and immaturity were synonymous in my life. I dated a girl for a short period of time. It was not a relationship that was inspired by God. We broke up. Two months after, she called and said she's pregnant. I wondered who the father was. I'm sure that was painful for her to hear. I denied responsibility. Later on in her pregnancy, I admitted responsibility. Abortion, adoption, I chose abandonment. When our son was born, the day he was born, he did not hear my voice because I was so far from the hospital. I was so far from God. I was so far from being a father. I was so far from being a man. I wasn't a man. I was a boy and not a good one. I was a bad boy. We made up after she gave birth, just she and I, and we had a conversation. And she said, I've changed my mind. I don't want to put him up for adoption. I said, I disagree. We already signed some paperwork. We got to go through with it. She said, you know what? If you don't want to be his father, that's fine. I'm going to be his mother. I'll never look for you. I'll never ask you for a dime. I was like, fine. I pretended to move on. I say pretend because a lot of times we think we moved on. You can go to a new place. You can go to new people, new possibilities, but the old you goes with you. So I got an academic scholarship 
full tuition scholarship to American University, but my pain and shame was like a beach ball I'm trying to keep suppressed under the water, but it keeps popping up. So I'm never missing a party, but never going to class. Uh, I had a 4.5 GPA, 0.45 GPA. <laughs> In the decimal, carried a one. Um, so by the time I was 19, I'd lost my virginity through disobedience. I don't say purity because purity is a matter of the heart, and I'd already lost that. I lost my son through negligence. I lost my scholarship through incontinence, which simply means God makes you, sin makes you senseless. I was high, never on drugs, just on arrogance. I was drunk on selfishness. I was searching for significance, didn't know I was born with it. Call it ignorance. I was lost separated from God, waiting judgment, expecting punishment, but God. But God. You got to have a but God in your life. But God made me aware of his presence because he's always present. He showed me kindness. He brought me to repentance. He brought me beneath the cross. There he was, I stood crying while he was dying. I'm watching him bleeding for me, forgiveness dripping on me. Now I'm blood rinsed, got some common sense, fire starting to burn within. Got a new license and I'm about my father's business. Surrender to God at 19. He put me in a church where I could be pastored by Pastor Brett Fuller. He baptized me, met with me, told him everything you now know. He said, God's going to use you to be a, a great man one day and influence people. I'm like, that's what men like you are supposed to say to men like me. <laughs> Try to make me feel all right. Went back to school, got freshman forgiveness, scholarship reinstated, grades 3.8, 3.9, dean's list, graduated. So if you were feeling good about my point five, four or five a minute ago, change your game. I was on the worship team. Young lady was singing, I was playing horn, Mary Ann. My heart was drawn to her, but I did it totally different the way I did it before I was saved. I talked to God about it, talked to my pastor about it, talked to my family about it, invited the whole worship team over and cooked dinner for everybody so my family could meet her without me revealing my heart. Family gave me thumbs up. Old school. Wasn't Bumble, wasn't Hinge, wasn't whatever, whatever, whatever. But that's the moment where I invited her out and I said, listen, I'm thankful for our friendship, but my prayer is that our friendship would result in marriage. But if not, that we could remain friends. A year earlier, she'd already had that conviction and said, God, if he's the one, send him to me. 18 months later, Pastor Brett married us. We consummated the marriage on our wedding night. I didn't touch her. She didn't touch me. Ugh. I don't have time to go there. Don't have time to go there. Second time we went out, I was terrified. I said, I have a son I've never met. And if that's reason for you to just continue this relationship, I accept that. I was shook because I'm like, she's going to end it. She's going to end it. And she said, I can't wait to meet him. Oh. Who are you? Back to that moment when he said, 
do you have a son? I was speechless. By that time, I had read about Acts chapter 5, this couple named Ananias and Sapphira, who lied to the Holy Spirit and dropped dead. I had read that. I had read that. Nobody else in the room. Bishop Brett knew. My wife knew. A couple of friends knew I had a son. But everybody was in the room like, oh, Mary, I must be pregnant. She must be pregnant. The prophet just early. He just early. And he saw my, I, I was so glad I had told Mary Ann. I would have been a different mom, like, excuse me, sir, one moment. Um, <laughs> hey, honey, um, so, uh, see, what had, what had happened was, <laughs> what had happened, listen, if you know you're about to get married to somebody, if there's something in your past that potentially could affect your future, then you might need to say to them, listen, there's something in my past that could come up later. Do you want to know about that or be surprised? <laughs> Let them choose. Two weeks after that, I got to speed up. Two weeks after that, I'm going to my job and I physically bump into this woman and it's my son's grandmother. Two weeks after. She gives me her daughter's number. I go home, I tell Mary Ann, we make the call. She had already moved out of the D.C. area. It was a 919 area code. He answered, she answers the phone. I said, this is Donnell. It's been years since we talked. And I am, I'm, I'm, I've asked God to forgive me, but I've never asked you to forgive me for failing to be a man responsible to you and to our son. I'm a Christian. I'm following Jesus. I'm married. We're in a great church. And I'm ready to be responsible as a father in every way, financially, spiritually, emotionally, everything. There's a pause. She said, I wouldn't believe a word of anything you said, except that I just became a member of this church in North Carolina. And the women in the church realize I'm a single mom. They've been praying that the father would come forward. And now you've called your son. Your son is, yeah, your son is seven years, turning seven years of age. And he's starting to ask, who's his father? I said, wow, what's his name? Jonathan. Okay, great. And, and what, what is uh, what church do you go to? And she said, I'm at Kings Park International Church, led by Pastor Ron Lewis. <laughs> Pastor Ron, stand up. Pastor Brett, stand up. I told my former girlfriend, I know your pastor. Like, that's not possible. Yeah, 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 yeah. We have a global family today in 80 nations around the world. At that time, the churches that are now part of the global family, there was one in D.C., and God brought me there. There was one in North Carolina, and he took my girlfriend and my son there. Perry Bokholder was the youth pastor for my son in Pastor Ron's church. Pastor Ron's son actually played viano, uh, violin with my son, John. So... Pastor Brett, Pastor Ron, are there no elders among you wise enough to judge this matter? We did a FaceTime. Oh, no, there was no FaceTime. We did a telephone call. <laughs> they determined child support. I was like, oh, lump in my chest. That hurt. But it's right. We hung up. The, I talked to my son. We hung up. Pastor Brett gave me the first check for child support. I gave it back. I said, no, I've been irresponsible long enough. You men can sit down. We then drove me and Marianne to North Carolina. It was the longest five-hour drive of my life. I didn't want Marianne to go. I told her, babe, it's going to be overwhelming for uh, our son to meet both of us. Let him just meet me. She said, no, I told you I can't wait to meet him. Man, what are you trying to pull? <laughs> I don't want my wife of six months to meet my former girlfriend where there was drama. And so I told people, I never watched soap operas, but I know what drama looked like. <laughs> so I'm praying all the way. We get to the church. We walk in the lobby. The sanctuary doors open. This little boy walks out. His mom's behind him. So I know it's him. And like a reflex, I just kind of take a knee. And he comes close to me. This moment is hurting me. This moment is blessing me. This moment is hurting me. This moment is blessing me. This moment is hurting me. This moment is blessing me. This moment is hurting me. This moment is blessing me. This blessing feels like it's hurting me, but ultimately it's going to be blessing me. And he lays his head on my shoulder, and it's beautiful and awkward because most people hold their children long before they're seven. And his mom keeps walking, 
and my wife opens her arms and they hug and embrace. I think they're tears and a prayer. And I'm going, there is a God. <clears throat> Hallelujah. 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 God used this spiritual family to bring healing in my natural family. You need to be a part of a spiritual family in order for God to do some of the things he wants to do in your natural family. And as you do things in your natural family, they become spiritual family. At the cross, Jesus is natural and spiritual family. He's looking at his mama, natural family. He's looking at John, spiritual family. He says, son, your mama, mama, your son. It's all family. And John came to live with us and Marianne homeschooled him. And, and then he went to Howard University, biology major, graduated. Two things. One, he, he changed his name from Robinson to Jones, which I promised I would never do. He said, you're my dad. I'm your son. I want to carry your name. So he's Jonathan Jones. And my grandbabies are Zoe and Autumn Jones, his children. <laughs> Lastly, he gave me this statue and said, dad, do you know what this is? It's the day we first met. I didn't win an NBA title, but that's my trophy from God. And it's eternal because it will go for generations and 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 generations. Jones! We're done. Jesus is the one who is crying on the cross, but saying, come close to me. Crying, Father, forgive them, come close to me. Joseph was in prison one time. He had the keys to lock himself up. To this morning, for many of you, some of you have been holding out. Pastor Brock preached a phenomenal message, and many of you gave your hearts to Jesus Lord. But some of you, this is your moment. This is the moment where you say, I'm standing under the cross, forgiveness dripping on me. If you what Jesus lived the life we should have lived, died the death we should have died, and got up three days later. If that's you, stand on your feet if you're ready to surrender your life to Jesus as Lord. All over this room, anybody. Amen. Get up. He got up for you. Don't you want to get up for him? He got up for you. Don't you want to get up for him? He got up for you.